Well, good morning. I'm glad you're here and spending some time, and I hope you're having a good summer in this heat. Um, you know, we love stories, don't we? We just heard one, a very powerful one in the book of Mark. You know, narrative is the way we share our lives and our values. It is just deeply human that we tell stories. So I want to tell you a story. So a long time ago, when the Greeks reigned the world, there was a great king, King Minos. And he had a chief architect and he gave his architect a job. He said, I want you to take all the bad things in the world and I want you to put them somewhere away from the people. And so his chief architect designed a structure, a labyrinth to hold all the terrible things. And in that terrible place, there was a terrible monster, the Minotaur, who guarded the terrible things that people didn't want to see. And the Minotaur was cunning and lethal and he could not find his way out of the labyrinth. That was the good thing. So he kept the people safe from the things that would hurt them. But at the same time, the people were afraid of the Minotaur. They were afraid he would escape and kill them all. So he's always, even though he was away, he was always on their mind. And then along came a great hero, Theosis, who's willing to do battle with the Minotaur. And the king's daughter, Ariadne, well, she was in love with this great young hero and she didn't want him to die. So she came up with a plan when he went to the labyrinth. She got out her needles and her yarn and she knit a big ball of yarn for him to take so that in the labyrinth, he would just lay it out as he walked so that once he finished his mission, he could escape and walk right back out. Well, he entered and crept silently, gently into the labyrinth all the scary things around him, but his focus was to find the Minotaur. And after many confusing twists and turns, he came upon the beast and the monster was asleep. Thinking he could kill him swiftly, he went at the beast, but he awoke. And then a great fight started, a huge roaring fight back and forth. And Theus is skillfully fighting with sword, parlayed the, the monster back away from him. And then in a quick, brilliant move, he slashed the Minotaur in the throat and slayed him. And because of the yarn, he made his way up back safely into the world. A little tongue in cheek, it was a good yarn, wasn't it? <laughs> Got your attention. See, we like stories, don't we? But hang on to the story for a second for a real reason. Think about the story. How many layers do you hear in the story? What, what did you think about when I was telling the story? Pay attention to that. That's the most important thing. And the leaps, the number of themes just leap out, don't they? Theme upon theme about this simple ancient story from the Greeks. And you know, there are lots of ways to play it. So when I play with it, I do it like this. Life is scary. And I've been there when those things that would kill me, I prayed to God someone would put them in a labyrinth that I could not get to and they couldn't get to me and couldn't harm me or the people around me. And you know, we wanted and we do want all of us to have that, don't we? That place where it could stay. But you know, those things that would harm us, they still come at us even though they're put away. They come at two in the morning when you wake up and they're still with you and they're more real at two than at two in the afternoon, always. And so the, there you are awake and defenseless. And those times I want a mighty warrior and I bet you do too, a hero to defend us, to defeat what is against us. But if we don't have one, we might have to do the battle ourselves and walk into that frightening labyrinth of life's pain and confusion and loss. And if we do, we need a roadmap in, but we also better need a roadmap out. Maybe we all need our own magic ball of strings so that once we've conquered that which is against us, we can make our way back into the real world. See, if we do justice to stories, you know what I've always wanted to do, really and truly, is to have talk back church, is to talk and ask you, what are you thinking about right now? 
What, what strikes you? Because what strikes you is the inspirational part. That's the important part. And then have us all share that and listen to one another because that's the value and the richness of this deep webbing of human experience that we all share and carry along. I don't have to tell you to do that. Stories are the way that humans talk. It is the way we transmit our lives. And we talk about the deeper parts of the journey through stories. And stories are from the beginning of time. They are, as Disney reminds us, they are as old as time, aren't they? They help us make sense of anxieties and fears. They help us navigate a world that is gray. Oh, so much more gray than it is black and white. So if you're black and white, you don't like stories. But I don't know anybody who's black and white that a story does not speak to him or her. And stories tell us truths that facts and numbers, and I think in our modern age of video and instant information, cannot even get near, cannot touch what is going on. You see, in the old days, we knew that. Somehow we've lost that story is exactly what we're after. It is what holds us together. And fiction is often truer than nonfiction, isn't it? That's the reality. You know, Mark was telling a story and we read it this morning and it is fanciful. And if you wanna believe all that stuff, you just go ahead. <laughs> you see, it wasn't written for that reason. Do you know why Mark wrote his story? It was a little book, more than likely. It was actually bound. It was wildly popular in first century Rome to write little books about people. And they bought them like gangbusters. They were instant sellers. You clever, clever, clever Mark. You see what he's doing? He wanted people to read the story of Jesus. He wanted regular people who did not go to the underground, who did not hide themselves away to follow this Jesus, to access this powerful story so that everybody could hold on to it. He accomplished his mission, didn't he? The church grew tremendously after Mark's time. And we still read the book today. We still read this little book today, over and over and over. And the story in this little book that we read today is based on a little bit of history that you don't know about and you probably don't care about, and that's okay too. But Herod, the main character, not a nice guy. The whole lineage of the Herods, they weren't nice people, but they were in power a lot. And did you catch what he did? Now, this is the uh, soap opera part. You ready? He took his brother's wife to be his own wife. You think that caused a family problem? <laughs> I bet it did. The small problem that it caused the whole society, though, it led to war with the Nabataeans. Because guess who his first wife was? The daughter of the Nabataean king who lived about 25 miles away. He was not happy and he resoundingly beat the stuffing out of Herod and his soldiers. Do you see, so Mark gives us this little bit of history in this wonderful story that's been layered upon in our modern era with all the things about Salome and her dance of the veils and things that have nothing to do with scripture, but they're a lot of fun. But boy, did he not get us to listen to the story. I heard it immediately when he said he took his brother's wife. I went, whoa, is this fun? Oh, I'm going to listen to this. Do you catch it? So within it, though, there is a moral, isn't there? Stories have morals. What's the moral? What's the moral for you? Well, one might be one that you not catch. But John was a truth teller. Kind of dangerous to be a truth teller. Because you know what Herod did? Herod, historically we know, it's accounted that he put him in prison and had him executed. That's the real history. And you know what John was talking about? Mr. King, you said you're a king, you kind of even imply that you're a deity. Well, deities don't steal their brother's wives. Didn't make him popular. In fact, it got him killed. So Mark lifts that little bit of truth up like this for us. And then you're in my job week after week, week in, week out, day in, day out, is to figure out what in the world does that have to do with me? 
Why did I bother to read this? And why do we bother? Well, if it's not apparent, it becomes apparent. It has through my lifetime. It has when I live with you. We work, we move, have our being, as the prayer book says, say our prayers, think about how the world should be, and realize that we're called to be truth tellers. That's really what we're about. Society's coined it as some new age thing. And I'll remind you, John died a couple of thousand years ago for telling the truth. It's easy, of course, to tell the truth about others, but sometimes that's what it takes, right? To tell the truth about what's going on. We stand, the church seems to stand for the reality of what is true. The church stands for the reality of what is true and factual and provable. Reality's hard. So when you come here, you grow up. Even our youngest back there, even our youngest who are eight years old, we ask them to grow up and learn to live in reality. And God is always in that reality. That's our faith, that the God up there is the God right here, the faith of our reality, walking every day with us. And remember, truth is hard, but also remember truth sets you free. Is that not an axiom you were taught as a child? Hey, by the way, this is a conversation. <laughs> I'm not talking at you, I'm talking with you. We're taught that the truth sets us free. The truth sets us free. That's what this story's about. This funny little weird story. Free to follow and be part of the kingdom of God that can, God continues to build on your shoulders, on your faith in this generation. It's dependent on you all to leave here and go build the kingdom. It's dependent on me to go build the kingdom. That's what we're here to do, to get some nurture, to get some sustenance, to hopefully find some direction, to find some counsel, find some fellowship and friends, find a place we can renew ourselves, and then go out there and do the work. It's a great job to have. And you don't have to look for it, it will come to you. And who knows, I kind of really wonder if maybe, just maybe when all is said and done, the hardest truth that the church teaches us to tell is the truth that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Amen.